Well, as Marnie mentioned a few moments ago, today we are wrapping up a series of messages that we've been doing on the 23rd Psalm. And before we jump right into that, just a couple of housekeeping items. Number one, uh, kids up to fifth grade. We do have a program for you today. want to, you to know that. I think next month things will be a little bit different for the rest of the summer. But today, if you're still in the room, kids, you're welcome to head on back. And we have folks that uh, are ready to meet you and uh, lead you to your program for the next few moments. I also want to add my own word of encouragement to the men in the room. I would love for you seriously to think about, and not only think, but take a step to sign yourself up for the Lake Champion weekend in September. I had my first uh, experience at Lake Champion a year ago. Uh, This is not your typical site for a church camp. For one thing, The food is really good. The accommodations are good. And then really, most importantly, uh, I think what this weekend could mean uh, for our men, one, to just be uh, be with each other, to be together from Grace Church would be really positive for our congregation. And then perhaps most importantly, what this weekend could mean for uh, your home, for your family. Uh, really significant time. Priority One Lehigh Valley is also a mission partner of our church. Uh, We've been supporting them for years and uh, the Lake Champion Weekend is just a great way again for us to show our support to Priority One. So guys, Steve Fessler is gonna be in the lobby. There's a table. Even if you just have questions today, I would urge you, speak to Steve, me, Anybody around you that had their hand in the air when uh, Marnie asked us to raise our hands, we'd love to talk to you about the late champion weekend. A question for you. Where is home? For some of you, you might think immediately of the house where you live right now. When you think of the word home, you think of a street address, you think of a, uh, a, a residence, you think of a zip code, you know exactly where home is because your home and your house are one and the same. For others of you, you may not think of a particular house or address, but you think of where you are from. You think of the place where you grew up. Maybe you haven't really lived there for years, but that's where your people are. Or as uh, you might hear down south, that's where your kinfolk are. And so when you think of home, you think of the place where your roots go down a bit deep. You think of that place that really shaped your identity as you grew up. That's home, even though you may not live there right now. Some of you may be a lot like me and Marnie. Maybe for you, the word home is a little harder to get your head around because home has been a moving target. And that's because you have been a moving target. Maybe uh, the company, the business, whatever it was, it might have been the military, they've moved you from place to place to place. And honestly, you have to think about it. You're not really sure where home is. I know uh, two summers ago when Marnie and I came up here to Bethlehem and we came, our daughter was away at a summer program, our son was with us, but he was going to be going off to college, and we came here to Bethlehem, but we were living in someone else's house. And it took, it really just took a while to get my mind around the idea that this was our new home. In fact, within just a few months, the holiday season came, Uh, it was Thanksgiving, and I was telling people, I was just casually kind of mentioning, oh yeah, we'll be going home for the holiday, meaning Georgia. Marnie kind of said to me, you know, you 
may not want to tell the people who moved us up here that you're going home uh, for the holiday. But let, what's interesting is I've noticed even that has begun to change because this past year, when we had been home during uh, uh, where our families were during Christmas, uh, we had been there about a week and we had done the Christmas thing and I said to Marnie, I said, you know, I, I, I think I'm ready to go home. And home was here. And so during the uh, first few months that we'd been here in Bethlehem, some friends in the congregation gave us uh, a set of glasses. I think you might have seen them already. We have this in our, our place. They gave us these glasses that say, home. And for those of you who are geographically challenged, that is the state of Pennsylvania, by the way. I don't know if you're kind of looking at that going, what? But yes, that's the state of Pennsylvania, it, again, I ask you the question, where is home? Today we come to the last verse of Psalm 23. We've been making our way through this uh, very familiar passage of scripture, and today we end with a homecoming. Literally the final verse that brings everything home. And as with the rest of this psalm, the words may be very familiar. I'm going to get you to join with me. We're going to read verse 6 together. Would you join me as we read this? Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. It's a homecoming. Dr. Craig Barnes is the president of Princeton Theological Seminary, and among his many books, one of my favorite is a volume called Searching for Home. And easily uh, one of the most engaging and gripping moments in that entire book is the very first chapter where Craig Barnes recounts his childhood when he was somewhere in his early teens, his dad left their family. He left their home. And Craig Barnes says that for the next 30 years, they really had no idea where his dad was. He lived a life, a kind of a nomadic, wandering life, from time to time, they might have gotten an address where they, they had heard he was, but whenever they tried to send a piece of mail, almost always it came back stamped undeliverable. From time to time, they would get a phone number where they believed he might be, but when they would call, almost always they would get the recording the number you are trying to reach is no longer in service. Craig Barnes grew up really never knowing where his dad was. Until he had gotten well into adulthood, he had his own family. He was serving as a pastor and somewhere around the year 2000, near the Thanksgiving holiday, he got a phone call that his father had passed away. His dad had been living in a camper trailer somewhere in, in the state of Florida and Craig Barnes and his brother, they went down for the funeral service, met the pastor of a small church that his dad had been involved with. And as Barnes reflects and remembers that experience in that first chapter, he wrote these words. For years, I have rehearsed my favorite lie, telling myself that my dad was a strange anomaly and my life will never look like his. As comforting as that has been, I know it's not really true. Dad is but an extreme illustration of what has already happened to my own soul 
and pretty much every soul I care for as a pastor. We are lost. And nothing is harder than finding home again. The real home for which we yearn isn't the place where we grew up or the new place we're hoping to build, but the place we were created to live. That's an important phrase. The place we were created to live, paradise. We were created to live at home with God, which defines, excuse the typo, my fault, which defines paradise. Look at that last sentence. We were created to live at home with God. That's where we were made to be. And there's something restless inside of us, a a kind of yearning. We are looking for home. We're searching for home. And so we come today now to the last verse of Psalm 23. And if we'll think on it, kind of linger with it, if I may use the word, meditate on it. Meditate on these words. These words will answer for us two very important questions. Questions. Number one, where is home? And then, how do we get there? Where is home? And how do we get there? Psalm 23, uh, probably for many of you, and I, I know this was said several weeks ago when we began this series. Many of us are familiar with the words of Psalm 23 because we have attended a a memorial service or a funeral. Very often, the 23rd Psalm is read at graveside or in a funeral service. And maybe the reason we connect the 23rd Psalm with that kind of moment is because of, well, actually two verses. One that Marnie talked about last week. We walk through the valley of the shadow of death. But then we come to this last verse that says, we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And for many of us, when we hear that or we read that, the first thing we think about is that's talking about heaven. So maybe we need to think and ask, what does it mean to dwell in the house of the Lord forever? The Hebrew word that we bring over into English as forever literally says, for length of days. I will dwell in the house of the Lord for length of days. Well, what is that? Does that mean as many days as I have? Does that mean the days of my life? And then what is the house of the Lord? I learned as a, you know, as a kid going to church, the house of the Lord was the Baptist church that I showed up in every week. That was God's house. And that was why you were never supposed to run in church. That was like completely forbidden. And even in the Hebrew mind, often when we, they speak in the Psalms or in the, the Old Testament of the house of the Lord, they are thinking literally of the temple. It could be a place of worship. So the psalmist says in Psalm 84, how lovely is your dwelling place. My soul yearns for the courts of the Lord. The courts of the Lord, that was the place where where they went to worship God. That was the house of the Lord. But if we look around a little further in the book of Psalms and other places in scripture, the house of the Lord is not just heaven and it's not just a temple, but it is to be in God's 
presence. And so we read these wonderful words, I think, out of Psalm 27. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his what? Dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent. There's another word, another image for this kind of dwelling. And he will set me high upon a rock. That's an interesting verse. The one thing I ask of the Lord, maybe just a little side comment to you today. If you were to ask God for one thing, one thing, what would it be? For the psalmist, it is to be in the house of the Lord. But that's not, that's not simply a place of worship. That is to be in God's presence. To be in the house of the Lord, to be in his dwelling, to be in his sacred tent is simply to be with the God who created us. To be with the shepherd is to be at home. Your true home is not your street address it's not the place where you live. It's not the place where you're from. It's not the place that you someday would love to build. Your true home is to be with God. There is no better place to be. Some of you may remember years ago, uh, Dr. Kent Brantley. I don't know if this name will be familiar to you. But about four years ago, there was an outbreak of Ebola on the African continent, especially in the country of Liberia. Dr. Brantley was a medical missionary with Samaritan's Purse. He was serving in Monrovia, Liberia, and he contracted the Ebola virus. He got a lot of attention because he was one person that was brought from that continent into the United States. Got a lot of people really anxious that someone with Ebola was coming to this country, but he went to Atlanta, Georgia. He was treated at Emory. And a couple of years later at the church Marnie and I were at at the time, Dr. Brantley spoke at a missions banquet for our church. And he told this story, all of which was very fascinating, but the one thing that I remember being really just sort of amazed by was that at that time, Dr. Brantley said he fully intended to go back to Liberia. I'm thinking to myself, are you kidding me? Dr. Brantley has a young family. And his plan was for all of them to go back to that place. And the way he explained it, the one sentence that I remember hearing him say, and I've heard other people say it, but I just remember him saying it that night at that banquet. He was going back to Liberia because he said, there is no better place to be than at the center of God's will. And friends, that is your true home. There is no better place to be. You were meant to be with the God who created you. You were meant to be with the shepherd. So I think we could really say it like this. Home is a presence more than a place. Home is a relationship more than a residence. It's a presence more than a place. It's a relationship more than a residence. And maybe you're in the room today, you know this. Maybe you lived in a house and raised your children. 
And maybe your spouse has passed away. And the place where you live feels different. Because home was where she was. Home was where he was. There, there's something about a presence. And our true home is to be with the shepherd. Everything about Psalm 23, really, you could say, describes home. When you're home, you have everything you need. You do not want. You find rest. You're restored. When you're at home, even though things can be going on in the world around you, you do not have to fear. No one should be afraid in their own home. And it's a great sadness today that some people are. No one should be afraid in their home. In the home, there's a table prepared for you. At home, your cup overflows. Home is a presence, not a place a relationship, not a residence. So if home is to be with God, then we might ask, well, how does that become real for you? How does that happen? And here's the great news today. God is actively at work to bring you to himself God is actively at work to see to it that you find your way home. He wants you to be there. He makes it possible for you to come and to be with him. And the way the psalm says that in verse verse 6, Psalm 23, verse 6, is that his goodness and mercy follow you all the days of your life. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will find my true home. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. God is actively at work with his goodness and his mercy. Interesting word, that English word follow really carries the idea of pursue. God is not following us to just kind of see where we go. God doesn't follow us because he doesn't know. You know, often when I tell somebody, hey, follow me, the reason I say follow me is because they don't know where we're going. That's not the way God follows us. God's following is far more intentional. It's kind of a pursuit He's coming after you, not to chase you down, but to get you where you were meant to be. When my kids were very young, the house we lived in, there was a a pool and, and tennis club in our neighborhood, and it was only maybe a half mile down the street and around the corner. And when my kids were, when we first moved there, my kids were very small, they'd say, take us to the pool, take us to the pool. And even if I was tired, I might be worn out. Eventually, I would just give in and I would take them to the pool. We'd pile in the car, we'd take all the stuff we needed, and we would go to the pool. Well, years passed, and the day came when they didn't want me to take them to the pool. They wanted to. We. We okay here? All right. Thank you, Steve. All right, I'm going to look for a handheld up here somewhere perhaps and maybe go with that. But the day came when they didn't want me to take them to the pool. They wanted to ride their bikes to the pool. And again, I kind of resisted. It made me nervous. They were still small. But finally, the day came when I said, okay, you can ride your bikes to the pool. Go ahead. So they got on their bikes. They took off for the pool. I gave them about two minutes, and then I followed them in the car. I did. 
I got in the car and I followed them. But there were a couple of things about that. One, they did not know I was there. And two, I wasn't following them to find out where they were going. I was following them to ensure that they got there. His goodness and mercy follows you. God pursues you. He is actively at work to bring you home, to bring you to himself. You know, probably the best known parable that Jesus ever told was about a guy that left home. He left his dad. He left his brother. He went off to make a home for himself. (laughs) He might have felt like some of you feel. He probably thought, I want to get away from this place as far as I can. But you know what? It did not go well for him. And the day came when he said to himself, you know, the home that I rejected was a whole lot better than the home that I've made for myself. And so he went back. He made a plan to go back. I will go back home, but I'm going to work really hard to get into the good graces of my dad. Problem was, he had already dishonored his dad. And in that culture and in that community, you could not just come back home. He would have been completely cut off, except except for this one moment. It's in Luke 15, verse 20. It said that while he was still a long way off, his father saw him. I think we have this scripture. Yes. He was filled with compassion for him and ran to his son and threw his arms around him and kissed him. Once the father had gone to the son, it said to the entire community, I want him home. I welcome him home. He was able to come home because his father brought him home. And God still does that. He does that today. He'll do it now. He will do it for you. And so we're going to end like this. Some of you know somebody, maybe in your family, maybe somebody close to you, someone you care about, and they are a long way from home. They're a long way from home, even if they've lived in Bethlehem their whole life. And today we're simply going to pray. I want you to pray for them, but maybe... One of you, someone in this room, today is a day to turn your face toward home. To begin making your way back home. You will always find a God who is ready to bring you to himself. In fact, he is already following you. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. God, we are so grateful for your goodness and mercy. We're thankful for the way throughout our life you pursue us, you follow us to bring us home to you. And so, God, we pray today for people that we love, people that we care about. We ask, God, that you would be at work to draw them to yourself. And, Father, I pray for anyone in the room today who might be far from home, far from you. Father, would they know today of your goodness and your mercy? And would you bring them home? 
And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.